Hello. Today, it is the public that's in charge. You're the boss, after all. Is that OK? Sorry, what's after that? Sorry, can I start again? One room, six tribes of voters. Nearly 50 members of the public. Nice guy, but weak. Not strong enough. It's like he's reading from a script when he talks. Yeah, it does have charisma. Yeah. A dim view of the Prime Minister, shared by some of his own colleagues back in Westminster, where this week there was even a botched attempt to get him out. No one likes the guy who's shouting iceberg, but I suspect that people will be even less happy if we hit the iceberg. Keir Starmer was all too happy to pile in too. I, I love this quaint tradition where the more they slag him off behind his back, the later they cheer <laughs> in here. But our members of the public weren't much more impressed with him. A bit boring to be honest with you. I don't look at him and think he's the one that's going to come and save us. I don't know what he actually believes. So we have one big question. Can Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer answer the public's lack of faith? With us in the studio for the first time to answer that question, the Business Secretary, Kemi Badenoch. From Labour, we'll be joined by Jonathan Reynolds, who's after her job. And with Donald Trump plotting a course back to the White House, what would that mean in what seems like an increasingly dangerous world? We'll hear from the boss of the American Navy. We've had both Republican and Democratic presidents who've always abided by the core values of our country. And when you have someone who doesn't ally to those core principles, it makes you wonder, you know, should you be supporting that individual? Morning, morning. The public is in charge. Yes, you. But with me at the desk for the duration, the former Conservative Cabinet Minister, Nadine Dorries, Luke Trill from the research group, More in Common, who put together the groups of voters we met on Wednesday, and Labour MP, Dr Rosena Aline Khan, who recently quit her job as a Shadow Minister for Mental Health. But first of all, a quick hello to Kemi Badenoch. You're very welcome to the studio this morning. How would you describe the mood of the country at the moment? Uh, it's uh, something which I see uh, in my constituency, you know, in public meetings. There is a general sense of fear about the whole world, but specifically uh, their own personal security. And that's one of the reasons why we are doing as much as we can to focus on those things that matter to them. Uh, looking at bringing down inflation, which we've been very successful at, continuing to grow the economy and having a plan that just keeps, the, uh, keeps us going, makes sure things are, are, are under control. OK, well, Kemi, we'll be with you a bit later in the programme. Let's have a quick catch up on what is making the news today. The Sunday Telegraph splashes with a story about shortages in the Navy. Later, you'll hear what the American top brass think about exactly that. It also features Kemi Badenoch's sacking of the post office chairman. The Sunday Mirror claims the Tories have rigged the election rules in their favour. But the Observer's front page story says four people were given asylum here because of fears of persecution in Rwanda, even though, remember, the government argues it's a safe country. And the Sunday Times splashes on its investigation into universities, cash for courses. Overseas students, it says, with fewer qualifications than UK candidates, are paying more to get in. So, a real range of front pages there, but you three, today we're going to focus on what's going on in the public's mind. Now, Luke, for people who are not as obsessed with politics as we are, what are focus groups, why do politicians use them, and what can we actually learn from them? Well, it's probably best to start off with what they're not. They're not an opinion poll. We're going to have lots of opinion polls in the run-up to the next election. They'll tell us who's ahead, you know. They'll also tell us a bit about what the top issues are. But opinion polls only get you so far. They can give you those headline numbers, but what they don't tell you is why people mm. think those things, you know, what's driving their attitudes. And the real advantage of a focus group is that you get to hear from people in their own words. Mm. They get to tell you directly. And it was certainly fascinating to sit and listen for hours to nearly 50 people about what's going on in their minds. And politicians use focus groups privately all the time, don't they, Nadine? How fed up do you think the public is? I think it's worse even than probably your focus group demonstrated. It's people are just the, the apathy, they've had enough, and, um, and they're dealing with real life problems. And sadly, 
we have failed them as a government due to our own internal uh, warfare which has taken place over the last five years. They're really seriously worried about cost of living. They're worried about an incoming Labour government and what that means, as I'm sure you will have heard from people in your focus group. And they're incredibly worried about how they're going to meet their bills at the end of each month, how they're going to pay their rent or their mortgages. There are a lot of people who are about to come off two-year mortgages that were on 1% that are about to go up to 4 or 5%. People are really suffering and we, I'm sad to say, have not helped them because of what are the MPs within my party mm -hmm. have been doing over the past five years? You sound like an opposition MP, <laughs> not a former Conservative <laughs> well, I can minister. Tell you I'm no Labour supporter, and I can tell you this that there is no love for Keir Starmer out on the doorstep. Well, we'll hear from voters directly in a few minutes, but Rosanna, your constituency in South London um, has sometimes been sort of a marginal constituency, mm. but you know, you've won that seat and held on to it. What is the mood of voters there? And do you detect much love for Keir Starmer? Firstly, people are totally fed up of the pantomime that has played out um, over the last few years in the Conservative government. There is a huge amount of distrust over how the pandemic was handled. There is a lack of any belief that Rishi Sunak is going to deliver any kind of government that works. They're fed up of people being an MP one minute and then auditioning for shows uh, to become like reality TV politicians uh, for the rest of the time. Look, Keir isn't auditioning for a stand-up show. He isn't auditioning for I'm a celebrity to get me out of here. He, he is a credible, serious politician. But, but let me tell you this, Laura, people are fearful. When it comes down to it, people don't trust politicians. Mm. They simply want to know how are they going to feed their children? Mm -hmm. How are they going to get a GP appointment? And how are they going to keep the roof over their head? Well, let's hear what people had to say then, because politics, of course, is about serving the public, getting things done on your behalf. And we wanted to spend one of our Sundays together really delving into what's on, on voters' minds. And with the help of Luke's research group, we invited nearly 50 voters from seats that went from red to blue at the last general election to give us their verdicts. It's not scientific, but the groups were carefully selected to represent the full gamut of views. Loyal Tories, faithful Labour voters, Conservatives who plan to switch to Labour, those interested in the smaller parties, whether the Lib Dems, Greens or Reform UK, and those all-important undecided voters whose ballots are still up for grabs. So watch and listen. Kemi Bednock, our Cabinet Minister this morning, is watching too. Here for you is a taste of Britain in a room. How would you sum up Britain in 2024? Depressing. Terrible state we're in. Dishonest and messed up. Falling apart. I think we're a country in crisis. I think it's the worst it's ever been. Remember, everyone coming here today are in seats that were Labour until Boris Johnson turned them blue in 2019. We've gathered together voters from all sorts of different backgrounds. Young, old, Tory, Labour, and those who yet haven't a clue who they'll choose. Only enough means Stephen dated 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Only it's... just met again. Here we go. What comes to mind when you see this person? I'm not allowed to swear a word. <laughs> uh, uh, no swearing. You can, be, you, you can be rude, of course. He was beaten by Liz Truss, who was also mm. useless. Yeah. So the fact that he was second place to her is baffling. Yeah. Incompetent cretin. Lack of gravitas. Nice guy, but weak. There's nothing like hearing it direct from the voters' mouth. It's not strong enough. No personality. You need a personality to rule. It's like he's reading from a script when he talks. Yeah, it does so. have charisma. Yeah. I think he's very arrogant. Mm -hmm. Because he's obviously he's like got more money than he knows what to do with. I would say out of touch, because I don't think he understands what the ordinary people go mm. through. Yeah. yeah, I see privilege, and I think mm. that's, that means that he's kind of out of touch with the, mm. with the lot of the common man that he's supposed to be representing mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I think he thinks he's doing a good job, but he's not connected with us. No, and not at all connected to real people. He just doesn't understand. He's wealthy. He's, he's like got a no idea what it's like. Yeah. For me, I feel like there's a real disconnect with, like, especially for working class and people that are really struggling. I don't think that being wealthy means you're disconnected. He's good or he's bad. People in this country don't like successful people. They're very bitter that they're not like them, and that's why I think everybody resents him. I don't think he's out of touch. 
I just think the problems he has are so vast. I thought he did a marvellous job as a, as a Chancellor. Give him a chance. Boris Johnson, for me, was more relatable. Mm -hmm. I think in Rishi Sunak's role as Chancellor, he supported me in my role at that time and helped me out a lot. I just think they were, they were a strong pair together when Boris was Prime Minister. Even among this group of Tory voters who say they want to stick with the party, the view of the country is so bleak and they've clearly had enough of the Conservatives fighting amongst themselves. No wonder we can't get anything done because there's fighting and bickering. We all want to be Prime Minister. You said Rishi Sunak lacks gravitas. Unfortunately, I, th I don't think he has that presence and I think having a presence within an organisation uh, means a lot, certainly in the environments that I've always worked in. The polls suggest the government's been unpopular for a long time, but that's not necessarily the same thing as feeling excited about Keir Starmer. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you see this person? Dull. A bit boring, to be honest with you, and I don't think he's the strongest of leaders. I don't look at him and think he's the one that's going to come and save us. He's very big on saying what he's going to do, but not on how. I don't think we know enough about I mean, he's, I mean, he's basically just come onto the scene. Yeah. And... I mean, he's come onto the scene saying, oh, we'll do this, this and this, but where's the money coming from to do this, this and this? I don't know what he actually believes. I think everything he says is to try and win the majority over. And then when he gets it wrong, he'll quickly realise and correct himself and then just looks stupid. Whereas I think Jeremy Corbyn was more, <clears throat> was like more grounded with was... his beliefs. I'd rather somebody that was either here or there, not. Mm. Somewhere in between. I don't think he's a working class leader, and I, I, I associate the Labour Party with working class people. I'm surprised that he accepted the knighthood because it seems strange to have a Labour leader who's knighted. Who would be in his cabinet? That's my fear. I don't think it'd be too long before they oust him and we'll go back to the Corbynite era. God forbid. God yeah. forbid. I think his kind of popularity has been helped kind of by default because of kind of the backlash of the Conservatives. I think you can only really judge him kind of when he's in power. I do actually think he's got integrity. I do think he will try, uh, but I do think he's got a big task ahead. This group all say they're going to vote Labour. They voted Labour last time, but it was really striking. There's no sense of passion for Keir Starmer. Still some question marks of what he's really about. Everyone in that room says they're going to vote Labour, but nobody in that room felt like they were excited about Keir no. Starmer. Because you don't know anything about I don't know anything about him. It's, to me, it's just like, just popped up out of nowhere. There's a lot of weight on his shoulders, uh, a lot of expectation about him coming in and being more moderate and maybe running away with this thing. And it's, it's not a given. There's, that a lot can happen between now and the election. I do like him, but I just don't know if he'll be strong enough with what's happening. Oh, no. I'm going to sit with him and Nigel Farage. <laughs> he looks nothing like Nigel. <laughs> it's not Nigel Farage, it's Keir Starmer. Again and again, our voters have shared stories of how the health service just isn't up to scratch. It's obviously at the top of many people's lists. Waiting times for hospitals, um, and it's virtually impossible to get a an appointment. You're waiting just to see the doctor over a week and by that time you're better, you don't want to go back to the doctors mm. or see the doctor. I mean, I have a heart condition mm -hmm. and obviously I can't, had to contact the hospital because I've waited 26 weeks up to now mm. and I've still not had an appointment mm -hmm. and then they told me I had to wait, the, the, the waiting list is up to 70 weeks. Obviously with me being a senior carer, um, there's times that I have to ring 111 mm. and the wait times for the ambulances are ridiculous. You know, your family doctor, you knew your family doctor, you went to a surgery and you saw the same doctor. Now it's multiple health centres. There must be a different way because how long can you throw money all the time without looking and saying, well, we're really not sorting the problem? People tend to work in the NHS for 20, 30, 40 years um, and they don't seem to have fresh blood coming in with new ideas. So people do what they do because they do what they do. Um, and so it never develops and they don't necessarily look from the bottom upwards how they can improve things. It's always from the top downwards. I graduated as a nurse, mm. so I've done three years of placement in hospitals and I've seen firsthand how the nurses work, how the doctors are and um, it's not valued enough. And I, I really don't know if I want to work as a nurse in this country right now. Why do you want to leave the UK? I don't want to be like living paycheck to paycheck and I don't want to be um, 
um, worrying about um, you know doing these long hours and is my son right at home you know if I can have flexible working and mm-hmm. if I can have um, let's say do um, agency working and receive like triple the triple the amount of money you know anything else the cost of living crisis it has is having a big impact on us being able to go out and socialize is just so much more expensive going to the supermarket your bills are so much more expensive every time you go into the shop the prices have gone up I'm a student and I can barely afford to eat some weeks. I've got two older, older boys and it's just worrying to how they're going to get on the housing market. High inflation is uh, something that worries me. I know it's, it's come down a lot but it's still quite high and, it's, and because of that it's keeping all the other prices up. When you're retired, your income's not keeping up with inflation. So along with the cost of living is our childcare costs which are astronomical. This is a, a you know, first world country, however, there is so much of a difference between, you know, the highest pay, the wealthy, and the ordinary people. The other thing I was going to say is about the environment, you know, the, the delaying plans um, in, in certain policies. I think they're going to do it by, like, 2035. Um, and then now they're extending that to, like, 2050, um, like the net zero policy. Yeah, it's just a bit of a concern for, like, our kids, our grandkids. <laughs> This group all plumped for the Conservatives in 2019, but they've changed their vote to Labour. So why? The Boris moment and all that came out about what he was doing, um, you know, in the lockdown and everything. There's people like me, you know, where my father actually died in Covid, you know, so that was a very sad time. I'm so sorry to hear that you lost your dad during the pandemic. Mm. When you found out some of the things that have been happening in government, how did that make you feel? Really sad, but like frustrated as well, you know, like so many lives had been lost, you know, um, and then, you know, Conservatives, you know, they're all having like these parties, you know, they're not social distancing. There's a couple of reasons that keep being mentioned that cover the switch from Tory to Labour. Partygate, the long memories of Covid, and what Liz Truss got up to. I think it's frightening how two people managed to destroy 10 million people's mortgages. Mm -hmm in the space of three days. And is that what shifted your vote? Yes, basically. And do you see a day when the Tories will get your vote back? Uh, they have to work hard at it. The actual tipping point for me was when Rishi Sunak, when the HS2 was cancelled for the North, and then he actually said, oh, it's OK, we're going to give Manchester, we're going to give them the tram link to the airport. And then he actually did, he, he named a, an area. It was like not even in the north. The only thing that they've promised us for years, and um, this, you know, scrapped it. He's not interested at all in, the, in any regeneration of the north or anything like that. I do think this divide's getting bigger, and, and that was when I decided that I need to change who gets my vote. I think we've all been conditioned to not really expect too much, and this is just the norm when it really shouldn't be as the public servants. We used to be a major power, and now we're floating like a little, little island of non-existence. If you could pick anybody, politician or not, to run the country, who'd do the best job at running the country, who would that be? At Harry running Bonderman. the country, it'd be an absolutely oh, brilliant prime minister. Absolutely. Yeah. Alex Ferguson. Alex Ferguson. Okay. Alan Sugar, because he he wouldn't take any nonsense from the boardroom. Obviously, oh, Martin Lewis. Martin Lewis. Oh, yeah. Martin Lewis. Martin. Martin. <laughs> oh yeah. I would like Martin Lewis. Yeah, I like Martin Lewis. Martin Lewis. Martin Lewis. Absolutely. Yeah. He's got a grip of everything. Yeah. Going on. He's very good, isn't he? He'd be. He'd make a good prime minister. We've heard from nearly 50 voters here today from all sorts of different backgrounds. It's given us a snapshot of Britain in a room. But it's hard not to conclude from their conversations that our politics is in a lot of trouble. There's a deep well of worry about the state of the country and a sense a change of government's probably on the way. But you don't really detect much faith that a new operation in number 10 would transform lives. There is, though, remember, probably about 10 months to go. Well, Kemi Badenock, the business secretary, was watching that along with us. She's here in the studio for the first time. A very warm welcome to you. When you hear voters talking about the Prime Minister, giving their honest view, he's not strong enough, he's out of touch, a nice guy, but weak, 
even Conservative voters aren't convinced by him. So how do you address them? What would you say to those voters? Uh, it was really interesting watching that focus group. I think three things uh, jumped out at me. Well, well, actually, a lot jumped out, but, 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 but three, three main things. The first is that people clearly uh, want to see a lot more hope and optimism mm -hmm. about the country. We, we have a plan, and we're, that's what we're using in order to show people how we're going to make the UK better. Uh, we need to do much more of that. I thought it was quite interesting, uh, the contrast between Keir Starmer and... Uh, Rishi Sunak, it goes to show that there's everything to play for in this election. People act as if uh, us losing, uh, losing a power and not being in government is a fait accompli. Clearly not true, listening to that focus group. And I think uh, the third one was just about how people are fed up with a lot of the toxicity, I would say, uh, in politics at the moment, where it looks like people are interested in their own personal ambitions rather than the, uh, for people in the country. And that's definitely something which I think I'll be able to address today. And we'll come to that in a second. But people are concerned also about real big problems in their own lives. Mm -hmm. Michael there, a father of six, being told he has a 70 week wait mm -hmm. for cardiac treatment. A student there saying, some weeks he can't afford to eat. Mm -hmm. It's more than people being fed up with toxicity. Many of those people think the Conservatives have failed them. Yes, well, what I would say, uh, and I have a particular insight being an international trade secretary, is look at what is happening in other countries. Uh, in, over the last few days, there have been protests in Germany, in France, Romania, Poland, the Netherlands, uh, about, uh, about these, these same issues. We are not alone in them. Inflation is not a UK-specific problem. But that's these are not global, a comfort for these, people here, it's, it's, though, no, is it? No, no it, isn't, it, it isn't a comfort. The comfort is that despite all of those difficulties, we are doing better than, uh, than those other countries. Yes, I know and I completely understand. I've been in that situation before, not having, uh, not having enough money to, to look after yourself. But we are doing everything we can in order to deal with those global uh, issues, energy costs, not just us, inflation, still the fallout of COVID, all the money that we spent then is having, uh, did have an inflationary effect. But we have someone in the prime minister who knows what he's doing, who is very competent, who is running the economy well and will continue to do so. And if we stick with his plan, we will be able to solve all the problems that the people on that focus group were but talking about. But if that's the case, why don't people believe that? So it's, it's, it's a great question. I can give you my, this is my theory. This is, uh, uh, this is, this is not a party line, but there is now too much uh, in terms of personality politics. There's too much uh, reporting, I would say, of well, Westminster gossip. You know, you have one of your panels who's written an entire book, uh, The Plot, mostly conspiracy theory. People are hearing all sorts of things that are not true about what we are doing. But and the focus is no longer on the work, for instance, that I'm doing, but on oh, perhaps whether I might be interested in being prime minister. It is all a distraction. But Secretary of State, your, your colleagues don't believe this is all a distraction. Just this week, a former cabinet minister, a colleague of yours, mm. Simon Clark, said the leadership is uninspiring and that Rishi Sunak has gone from an asset to an anchor. There are genuine concerns inside your own party that he's not up to the job. I, I may, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, I. I, I think it's really critical to remind people that there are 350 uh, t uh, Conservative MPs. So yes, one person wrote an article saying that he was unhappy. I called him uh, after that and asked him what on earth he was doing because this is exactly the sort of thing that we have to stop doing in public. We can have private discussions about what is going wrong. And I actually think it is healthy for us to have a debate. Uh, for there to not be a debate is, is unhealthy, but to play all that in front of, <clears throat> excuse me, in front of, in front of the public is contributing to the belief that we are more focused uh, on internal matters than external matters, and that is not true. We are very much focused on the priorities of the country. That's why Rishi had his five priorities. But whether you like it or not, and you're clearly frustrated by how much Extremely some of your colleagues spend talking about mm. this, your colleagues do discuss these things. A small they do, minority of them. But, but, but they do. That is the reality here. And even in this morning's papers, you're described as Kemi's in pole position with the rebels. They think she can shake things up and beat Starmer. Now, you're obviously frustrated by all of what you mm. see as speculation. Do you deny then today that you've had any discussions with 
those rebels? Uh, well, apart from calling Simon to tell him uh, to, stop, uh, to stop what he was doing, absolutely. And what I would say is that all of these things that you're reading, it's all anonymous briefings. I pick up the paper and I read, an anonymous friend of mine said this, an anonymous source said that. Who are these people? My friends would never do that. My friends care about me. The people who are stirring, they don't care about me. They don't care about my family or my welfare or whether or not this is something uh, that I actually want. This is all about them and their personal interests, but they are not that many. The vast majority of people are actually focused on making sure that a parliamentary party is working to deliver a Conservative government. Do you, however, still have aspirations to lead the party? You did stand to run as leader. I, I, I did. In July 22, uh, I did stand and I lost. Uh, if you'd asked me two years ago in January 2022, I would have laughed it off and said it was a completely crazy idea. You never really know these things until you're in the moment. What I would remind people is that after Liz Truss left, uh, I, stood, uh, I stood up and said, I'm not running again. Rishi is the person who should do the job. And I did so because I'd worked with him in the Treasury. I knew he had a handle on the economy. But also, I saw just during that previous leadership campaign just how many nasty and unpleasant personal attacks mm. that he had been getting. And I thought, this is a good guy. He does the right thing. And that's the team I want to be on. Not on the team of the bullies or the people putting out nasty personal abuse, but on the team of people who are focused on delivering for the country. Let's talk then about what's happened in your job, there was a dramatic event last night. Um, as the business secretary, it seems you removed the chair of the post office after yes. all of the things that have gone wrong. Why did you get Henry Staunton to stand down? What were your concerns? Uh, so when I became business secretary and the post office came to my portfolio, there were three things that I was really focused on. One, get the money out of the door. The last thing I wanted was for people to die without having the compensation. So that the they, compensation yes. for a post Post Absolutely critical. I talked about it in my conference speech. Kevin Hollenrich, brilliant uh, post office minister. So that's the first thing. Second one was making sure that it was fair, that everything that was happening was fair. So not just getting out uh, money out the door, but that the money was the right amount and what we were doing was fair. But the third one was looking at the governance around the post office. And that is where uh, my uh, deciding that we needed a new chair of the organisation uh, was important. It was just that? wasn't working. But what was that about? Was that there was a row over post office bonuses being paid? During the while well, the scandal over Horizon was still going on, what was it about? There, there, there were there were various disagreements uh, with, within the board, and when I looked at it, I thought that a change of personnel was what was required. I don't want to do HR uh, on live TV. These are human beings that we're talking about. It is very difficult to be asked to stand down from a, from a position, but I decided that given all of the difficulties the post office uh, is having, it's not just about Horizon, it's about the entire business model, how we make it work, that we needed someone uh, who could chair a board that, had, uh, that was able to deal with these things effectively. This whole saga, though, has been a complete mess. Successive governments have failed to, to grip it or even to understand what we now see is the scale of the problem. And people are angry. And one of our viewers, John Suffolk, has been in touch with us this morning. And he's actually suggested if Mr Staunton resigns, shouldn't Kemi Badenoch also resign to be accountable for everything that has gone wrong at the post office? Uh, no, I don't, th I don't think so. Uh, first of all, I don't think people really understand exactly what the structure of the post office uh, is. I am the post office's sole shareholder. So the, sh the shareholder resigning doesn't, um, doesn't make sense. I actually have uh, constituents who've been affected by the scandal. Uh, they didn't come to me until after the ITV drama. It's, it's, it's very interesting how a drama can suddenly bring mm -hmm. attention to all that's been happening. When I made a speech at conference referencing the Horizon scandal and talking about what we were doing, it wasn't covered. Instead, people again were talking about, oh, is this a speech for the leadership and so on. People don't focus on the work we're doing. There's just too much time spent on tittle-tattle and gossip. We've been working very hard. We put a bill through before that ITV drama uh, uh, was aired in December, making sure that people can get their money and, uh, and get it quickly. Just one last thing on that. Would you set a specific deadline to get it done? You say you've been working on it for ages. People must get their compensation. We asked the Prime Minister a couple of weeks ago if he would set a firm deadline. He wouldn't, would you? Uh, the Prime Minister has, has, uh, has said that we're, we're not setting a deadline. We're going to move as quickly as possible. There are always issues uh, with setting deadlines. I say this as well with, uh, with free trade agreements. You put a date on, people rush, they get things wrong. We are moving as quickly as we can. I promise we couldn't move uh, any faster than we already have 
happen. There is an inquiry that's ongoing. There's some stuff that has to happen with Fujitsu as well. So there are multiple moving parts. And setting a deadline uh, is not the priority. Getting the money out, getting fair compensation, sorting out the governance of the post office is the critical thing. OK, Cammy Bidnock. So much else we could have talked about, but it's great to have you with us this morning on this day when we've been hearing so much from you, our viewers and members of the public. So let us know what you think of what you've hear been hearing. You can send me an email, koonsberg at bbc.co.uk, or if you're social media inclined, you can use the hashtag BBC Laura K. So what did my trio at the desk think of what voters have told us this week and of what Kemi Bednock had to say? Now, Nadine, as you said at the top, it's very clear there's a lot of dis disillusionment with the Conservatives, but it's very clear also that people who were switching their votes are doing so because they think Boris Johnson let them down and also because Liz Truss blew up the economy. Now, you mm. nominated Liz Truss and you backed Boris Johnson, so it's on okay. you, isn't it? What a lot of people also say is that on the doorstep, they don't say to Conservative MPs who are canvassing, I uh, voted for Boris Johnson to vote against Jeremy Corbyn. They say, I voted for Boris Johnson. And we've seen Boris, we were five points behind in the polls on the day Boris Johnson was moved. We are now minus 20. What I would just like to say is I'd like to thank Kemi Badenoch for the plug for the book. But what I'd also like to say is the book actually exposes in detail her particular role in the removal of Boris Johnson. And it also predicts a number of things that are happening now, such as those who plotted to remove Boris Johnson would turn against Rishi Sunak very soon, which they are doing. And in fact, many of the predictions made are playing out right and now Kelly before Bad our eyes. She, She's now left the studio and we're not going to be able to put that point to her. But the point that she was making actually is people who enjoy stirring the pot should shut up. She completely well, denied she had anything to do with the plots and rebels. one of those people, so I would suggest that she takes her own advice. Kemi Badenoch launched a failed leadership, botched, as reported in the media, a botched leadership bid against Rishi Sunak last December. Her mentor, her, the people that she works with, are the same people who removed Boris Johnson. And these people, like Kemi and others, these rebels, they should actually, although Rishi Sunak was a key part of removing Boris Johnson, it was all part of the plan, they should get behind Rishi Sunak. Because so it would you're be saying insane. they should get behind Rishi Sunak? Kemi Badenoch and others, uh, um, Robert Jenrick and others, what they are out for is themselves. They are not out for the benefit of the individuals in the country and the citizens. When they removed Boris Johnson, we have had years of chaos. We had years of chaos while they were doing it. There has been no benefit mm -hmm. to the... There have been a, there's been a moral and professional uh, dereliction of their duty to do what they were done, what they were elected to do as public servants, that is to okay. serve the people. They are serving themselves, and Kemi Badenoch is one of those okay, people well, I would remind because they want to be both Prime Minister and leader of the Conservative Party. Well, our Party. viewers will also have heard her very firmly deny that she doesn't have anything to do with rumours and plots and things that are swirling, but you've of had course, your say. she's going to. Yeah. Rosanna, you were shaking your head then, but in our groups... It's very clear there really isn't a lot of love for Keir Starmer. As I say, it was not a scientific group, but it was carefully selected. What explains that lack of enthusiasm? Firstly, I'll say I'm shaking my head because we've got a cost of living crisis. People can't feed their children. They can't get to see a doctor. And all we've seen for the last 10 minutes is tittle-tattle and fighting and bad-mouthing between politicians, the very thing that so, causes the mistrust. So why then you don't are, do the, that well, so why then are oh, the voters... Oh, please, Nadine. Why come then? On, pipe down. Why then were the voters that we spoke to not saying... Oh, thank goodness, there's something fabulous yeah, look, on the table. You're, you're absolutely right. It made for difficult watching. I would say bring on a general election because what we have seen in the North West, where I believe the focus mm. groups came from, we've seen three parliamentary by-elections um, where Labour have had increased majorities, for example, West Lancashire um, and uh, Chester uh, being two of those. We have had council by-elections where the councils have gone from no overall control to now being Labour held. So I would say, let's take it to the voters. Let's let Rishi Sunak, if he can, if he feels brave enough, let the voters decide. But the point here is it was absolutely tangible that your leader is not creating a sense of hope or a sense of excitement in the country from that group. And there were Labour voters also who said, I don't know what he stands for. Would it be better if he took clearer positions and didn't change his mind on so many things? Laura, I think it's really important that to instill trust when you're asking people to vote for you and vote for your party and you want to make the case about being Prime Minister, you do have to set out your stall. 
and you have to set out your stall in a way where people do understand what you stand for and understand the tangible difference that they are going to get if you are Prime Minister instead of the incumbent. What I can tell you is that I was in Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet for three and a half years. He has got incredible integrity. There are things where language has been used by some of our senior politicians, for example, towards um, staff in the NHS who work incredibly, incredibly tirelessly. Like my last two shifts, the last two weekends, I've done 11 hours on the trot. Nurses, doctors working incredibly hard, you know, often being told that they're not working hard enough or that they should do more overtime or that they're not valued. Those things are painful and those things do resonate with And you're with referring people. to the kind of comments that your shadow health secretary, Wes Streeting, has made from time to there time. There have what been about... senior politicians that have made comments that have upset people and so, yes, they do have to win the um, trust. And what about the position of the party on Gaza? So you're one of those MPs who rebelled and voted for a ceasefire, which is not what Keir Starmer wants. Well, I can't comment on him not wanting that now. He has called for a sustainable ceasefire, but mm. I've been very clear from day one that there should have been an immediate ceasefire, release of hostages. Those who committed the terrorist attacks on the 7th of October must face justice. But, Laura, we have a humanitarian crisis of epic proportion. We have children losing their limbs every day. We even have acronyms for children who were found without any families remaining alive. We have children dying, choking on their own vomit on a floor of a hospital that is no longer functional. Enough is enough. And world leaders, leaders in this country, our Prime Minister has a duty to call that out because I don't and understand you want Keir how people, to do that straight I away. I believe every senior Western leader needs to take a stand against what is wrong and, and be very clear and vocal about calling for an immediate ceasefire. Luke, our two guests on either side have both spoken very passionately about what's going on. You do groups like these, listening to voters around the countries all the time. What surprised you, if anything, about that group and what's it really telling us? Well, aside from the fact that I think both parties need to get on with seducing Martin Lewis uh, pretty quickly. <laughs> um, what was so interesting, actually, was, you know, as you said, we put together those groups from people with very different ideological mm. views, you know, lifelong Tories, Labour voters, Green, Reform. And yet so many of the themes that came out were the same. There was mm. this real sense of malaise in the country, struggles with the cost of living, with the NHS, but also this sense that our political class mm. just weren't meeting the moment. You know, you heard time and time again about Rishi Sunak, nice guy, not strong enough, out of touch. But then on Keir Starmer, you also heard, you know, dull, bit uninspiring, you know, does he have a clear position? Uh, on things. So I think the really worrying thing is mm. there's this real time for change mood. Yep. The polls are to be believed. We are going to have uh, a change of government, but it's not being met with any enthusiasm. And mm. I think that's really worrying, not just for this election, but for the state of our democracy. Well, as there's well. 10 months to go, which a lot could happen in that time, but there certainly was that sense that the scale of the country's problems are not matched by the scale of the sort of ability of our politicians. Uh, just before we move on, Nadine, there's a report in the paper we must ask you about. You received £17,000 in severance yeah. pay, which was a mistake. Have you given it back? Well, I only saw the email on Friday night when I got home. But that means now everybody knows I'm not 49. <laughs> but are you going to get it back? Yeah, I'll pay it back on Monday morning. Back there are no Monday details morning. in the email <laughs> how to do that, but I will, I'm sure, find out. <laughs> I was gutted. There we go. Oh. All three of you, thank you very much for now. Well, the picture from voters that we spoke to for Rishi Sunak was not at all pretty. But as we've been discussing, their attitude to Keir Starmer was not really a reason for the Labour Party to get out the bunting. So let's talk to one of his top team, Jonathan Reynolds, who's after Kemi Badenoch's job as business secretary, is back in the studio with us today. Um, now, Jonathan, you've watched that film as well. Um, it was not a ringing endorsement for your leader. Why do you think it is for that group of voters that is not creating any enthusiasm? Look, of course people feel that way. I mean, we've had an unprecedented squeeze on living standards. No public services work as they should. And they, these people have seen political leaders, changes of prime minister, actually make the situation worse. If you think about Liz Truss and that mini budget that they referenced, incredibly reckless, real damage. Now, the, the only way those people will be convinced the political system can deliver for them is not through promises, it's through delivery. Okay, it's through building enough homes so people have places to live, giving them security in the workplace, getting investment in. You can't do that from opposition. You've got to win the trust of people to deliver for them. But the what? reason Keir is the right person to do that mm -hmm. is quite simply he is a working class guy who has achieved, got to the top of his field. 
in public service for the right reasons, incredibly decent, real integrity, dedicated himself, he's got the ability, and he's in politics for the right reasons. But, but you've got to, have to deliver for people to turn that kind of cynicism around. But what you're and saying there that. is that, of course, people feel cross about the state of the country, but actually no one's going to feel enthusiastic about politicians until they give you a chance in government. Actually, opposition leaders, political leaders who are not in power, can create excitement. They can instill inspiration sometimes from time to time. And on the substance of it, we heard from voters, they're not quite sure what Keir Starmer stands for. I mean, I'll read you one young voter, Johnny. I don't know what he believes. I think everything he says is to try and win the majority over. And after years in the job, why is it that people don't know what he stands for? Well, look, you have to fight for hearing in opposition. We understand that. But if you think about the clear positions Keir has taken, I mean, seeing you to abolish the, the super tax regime, the non-dom regime, and put that money into the health service, I think that is a clear choice. Seeing you're going to change the taxation of private education to put that money into state education, that is a clear choice. Saying, saying you're, you're going to build saying... homes and override the people who say you shouldn't build homes around here, that is a clear choice. And saying that... you're going to spend £28 billion on clean energy and green projects and saying, actually, no, then you might not spend £28 billion on green projects and creating jobs, that's not creating certainty. Sure, that's a, creating a lot people, of confusion. Think, yeah, people understand our ambition there is absolutely clear how much you can spend on anything is determined by the health of the economy and whoever wins the next election the inheritance doesn't look very good to be frank and of course we have been very clear we feel the fiscal rules we put forward essentially wanting to see debt fall mm. by the end of a parliament that governs those decisions not because we're not ambitious but because if you don't have that discipline you end up again like Liz Truss there false is, promises to people there's something more than that though isn't there because Keir Starmer has also dropped a whole host of pledges that he made in his leadership campaign. We've discussed them in this studio lots of times. And he's changed his mind on how fast he would bring in that £28 billion a year of investment. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for him to change his mind, do you accept that it has created that perception for some people that he doesn't quite know what he's about? He changes his mind all the time and therefore they're not quite sure. Well, look, I think we've got some very clear positions. I think circumstances do change, and particularly the, the health of the public finances, the cost of borrowing, that did change remarkably in the last few years. So mm. you, you've got no choice in opposition but to reflect on that and therefore put your, your programme forward, because, again, people don't want promises they don't think they can be delivered. But do you accept the perception of that? Well, I would say... If you want to know why Keir Starmer can change this country to pull it out of the doldrums, look at how he has changed the Labour Party. Look at where the Labour Party was in 2019. I mean, literally, mm -hmm. in an absolutely terrible state. I don't think most people believed one party leader in one term of Parliament could bring Labour back from that to be even competitive at the next election. Now, he has done that. And the, the courage, the resolve, the resilience he's had to show to do that tells you about the kind of Prime Minister he could be and would be if he's given that choice. Now, look... There's always more to do. We're very pleased with how the polls have changed, how mm. the by-election results have changed, but no one is complacent because we know where we are coming from to do that. And you've got to have the, the self-awareness to acknowledge an opposition. You've got to keep making the case, keep doing that. People only tune in a little bit to oppositions, I think, when you get closer to an election. But look at the progress that has been made mm. to date. I think that tells you a lot about the kind of person Keir Starmer is. Um, let's talk about the post office then. We heard the business secretary explaining or giving us a little bit of detail about why the chair, Henry Staunton, was sacked by her yesterday. Um, do you think it's the right decision that he was ousted? Look, the scale of the scandal in the post office is so vast, it's absolutely essential. The right leadership is in place. Now, the government have to tell us why they made this decision seemingly yesterday. I mean, that the person who's going wasn't actually there for the scandal, so there must be specific reasons why they don't have confidence in that person going on. But I think the public will want to know this is not just about one, one person, one chair being changed, that the overall approach in the entire organisation is going to come to terms with the scale of this, put it right, and also, fundamentally, people want to see the postmasters exonerated and compensation got to them as soon as possible. So of course, as we'll, things we'll stand, just, you're, you're, you're not saying whether you think it was the right decision or not because you haven't got enough information. Well, I, it's quite unusual isn't it, to have a decision mm. like this at a, at a weekend, but we'll find out in Parliament what next week it exactly what... for political reasons? Well, let's see what the government's account of this is. I think we would all want to know this is a substantive, evidence-based decision that we can clearly see the government's reasons for and have confidence in that organisation going forward. I mean, the scale of this, the post office, it's, it's more than just Horizon 
and, and the cover-up around that. I mean, this really goes to the heart of how, how power is exercised in Britain, how it, who's accountable for that exercise of power. And people are quite rightly incredibly angry. It's something in it. It's such a loved British institution. Power could operate in this way. Just before we finish, what a lot of people in your party are also very angry about is what is happening in Gaza. Now, we heard Rosanna talk very passionately about her belief that is shared by a lot of people in the Labour Party and maybe a lot of people watching this morning, that it is long past time for Keir Starmer to agree with her and others and say there must be a ceasefire. Do you think that time might now have come? Well, we have said we want to see a sustainable ceasefire, but we've been clear. That was my clear. question. Is well, it time clear. to That's go got to be both sides. That? That's got to be the release of hostages, like Rosanna said. It's got to be an end of rocket attacks to Israel. The bombing campaign has to stop in response to that. And therefore, also, the wider necessity of a, of a two-state solution, of a peace process put back on track, is part of that. We've just always been clear you couldn't have called for that when there was no willingness from Hamas to release hostages or to end the violence on their side. But of course, we all desperately want to see the violence end, a proper peace process put in place, and that humanitarian situation addressed with sufficient aid getting into the people but who need it. I think a lot of people watching might think, actually, our politicians have been saying that for quite a long time now, and nothing is changing. Well, I think there are leaders on both sides of this conflict that have made that particularly hard. But I think the role of the international community is to hold true to that long-term, sustainable way to end this for good. And that is what everybody wants to see. And of course, it is difficult, but we should never give up on that. And we have, and even in my lifetime, been close at times, mm -hmm. I think, to maybe some sort of resolution. It's imperative the leaders on both sides prepare their own people for what that would look like and are willing to work towards that. Okay. Jonathan Reynolds, thanks so much. Always great to have you with us in the studio. And whoever gets to number 10 will have to deal with an increasingly unpredictable world. Donald Trump may be on his way back to the White House, an unpredictable leader with an unconventional attitude to America's responsibilities to the rest of the globe, to put it mildly. And on Friday, there was another Houthi attack in the Red Sea, this time on an oil tanker, despite British and American strikes against Houthi targets in Yemen. Well, this week, I met the US Secretary of the Navy, Carlos del Toro, who was in the UK, and I asked him what is the point of the military strikes if the Houthi attacks just continue? Well, I think it's a, a very important observation to make. Uh, this isn't just about a military solution. It's about a diplomatic solution, right? And they're all, in, they're all interrelated in one way or another. We have a moral responsibility to protect our own sailors, uh, both from the United Kingdom and the United States and all the other allies that are partnered with us as well, too. Uh, but it's obvious that, that it will take more than just a military solution to this problem in order to resolve uh, the issues in the Middle East, uh, with impact, obviously, on what's going on in the Red Sea. For how long can you see these strikes continuing? For how long would you be willing sure to keep carrying on with these strikes? Sure, well, to your first question, I think perhaps we should ask around that question, right? They continue to support uh, Houthis financially and uh, with weapons capabilities as well, too, as discovered by the Dow that we were able to interdict uh, in the Red Sea, where we lost two Special Forces Navy SEALs. Uh, so perhaps we should ask them uh, for how long this will continue. My hope and expectation is that uh, uh, it will not continue indefinitely, and that we'll be able to go back to peacetime operations in the Red Sea and allow all this shipping uh, to proceed peacefully. But as I said, it will require a diplomatic solution with regards to what's going on in Israel and Hamas as well. But if it does continue in the Red Sea, though, you would keep firing missiles Absolutely. for as long as it takes. Absolutely. It's our job to save innocent lives, and that's what the United States and the United Kingdom is committed to. Our Defense Secretary told us last week he was disappointed that Benjamin Netanyahu had hardened his attitude against a two-state solution. Are you disappointed by that? As President Biden has said, uh, we should be supporting a, a two-state solution. But he has also made it clear that uh, that two-state solution necessarily can't be Hamas, because they've proven to be the terrorists that they are. Is the reality here that President Biden needs to talk tougher and more directly to Benjamin Netanyahu? 
Well, I, I won't get into the specifics of uh, the president's conversations with, uh, uh, with Netanyahu, but I assure you that uh, President Biden has been strong in his convictions that uh, we must bring justice to Hamas while at the same time providing the humanitarian assistance that's necessary uh, to the Palestinian people so that we can also stop their suffering. Over 25,000 um, men and women have also lost their lives. There are a lot of extremely tense situations in the world right now. Yes. There's the situation in the Middle East, there's the ongoing situation between Ukraine and Russia. It all contributes to a nervous atmosphere in many parts of the world and amongst many Western leaders. You said that the world should be worried by the prospect of Donald Trump becoming president again. Why did you say that? Well, I, I said that because I, it's my strong conviction that President Biden has provided the mature leadership both in the United States and stabilizing our economy, which was faced by many challenges early as he took office. Uh, rebuilding that economy and building the national security relationships with our allies and partners around the globe. You said, though, that President Trump was somebody who aligned himself with autocrats and dictators and that the world should be worried by the possibility of him coming back to the White House. What is your worry? Well, my worry is that, you know, we as Americans, for as long as I can remember, certainly since I served in uniform, we've had both Republican and democratic presidents who've always abided by the core values of our country, protecting the freedoms of Americans and other people around the globe and protecting democracy itself. And when you have someone who doesn't ally to those core principles, it makes you wonder, you know, should you be supporting that individual? You said he had a suspicious attitude to democracy. Absolutely so. And what might the worst outcome then be for the security of the world. Do you think America could leave NATO? What impact might that have? Well, I can't predict what the future would bring, um, but it will suffer un undoubtedly. What do you mean by that? It will suffer because we won't have the benefit of the mature leadership that President Biden has provided the United States and the world. In terms of public perception of the United States, though, the maturity the, the age of President Biden is a worry for many voters, even some Democratic voters. Now, you know him well. You work very closely with him. Should people be worried about that? Because American voters do worry about that. Now, some may, but I certainly don't worry about it as someone who's actually worked with him very closely on issues of national security. And I've seen him in action talking about the economy and many other issues uh, related to the United States. Uh, he is as sound as anyone that I know. And in terms of our, how our two countries work together militarily, you know, there are senior military leaders here who worry about the level of spending, who worry that our aircraft carriers are not out at sea in the way that people hope they would. Is our Navy big enough? Uh, well, I'm always uh, supportive of bigger navies, <laughs> both in the United States and the United Kingdom, but I think you should look at the problem in a different way. Uh, what's the value of not having that? What's the economic chaos that's created when you don't have a sufficiently sized Navy to be able to protect uh, the economic interests of the country, right? And so I think you should look at the opportunity cost that's created when you don't make those investments in your national security, in your Navy. Is there a risk that today, when money's tight, governments are not making the investments that we may well need in 10, 15, 20 years' time? Well, I, I think it is at risk, and largely because of the threat that's posed by Russia. Uh, and Ukraine, for example, and the Ukrainians are fighting for the democracy of all peoples around the globe. And uh, should Russia be successful in Ukraine, what does that say for what President Xi might do in the Pacific? Uh, what does that say for what President Putin might continue to do here in Europe? And so I don't want to be an alarmist of any way, um, but I always argue that my responsibility as Secretary of the Navy is to ensure that we have a Navy that can deter uh, and defend our economic interests in every possible way. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much. It's a great honor to have been with you and all your listeners, Laura. Thank you. Carlos del Toro there, the U.S. Secretary of the Navy. And it was interesting to talk to him about defense spending. You wonder if there's a lot of conversation about that here in the last few weeks building up, whether that might in the end be an issue in the election campaign, perhaps, who knows? And um, there's always a lot of pressure on all of public spending. Um, but I just wanted to end by quizzing all three of you on something slightly different, 
we asked our voters who gathered with us in Manchester on Wednesday if they could choose someone from outside politics to be Prime Minister who would it be? Lots of them said Martin Lewis, who's uh, getting pretty popular. Some said Alan Sugar, one said Carol Vorderman. Rosanna, who would it be, somebody outside politics, if you could pick? My mum. Oh. <laughs> yeah, she's pretty awesome. She, uh, she makes you toe the line, but she's very fair. What would she do if she ended up in Downing Street, Rosanna's mum? She'd be extremely kind to everybody, but she'd get stuff done. With a bit of a tinge of, I can just tell, there's a tinge of something else going no, on there. She might tell people off if they didn't do what she it's was It's that told. Polish mentality of um, getting on with the job, of um, being sensitive yet firm and um, just having loads of really good ideas. Nadine then, if it was somebody outside politics in number 10, who would it be? Uh, Jürgen Klopp. Jürgen Klopp. So he's, he's left Liverpool. <laughs> he's got so, a bit more time on his hands. Yeah, <laughs> and he's also, he's a man who knows how to manage a team. So, yeah. And what kind of things do you think he'd actually do if he was in number 10? Uh, knock heads together, <laughs> keep people disciplined, keep people focused, their eye on the ball, <laughs> which is delivering for the British people. <laughs> and Luke, who would you have? I mean, once upon a time you were a Conservative advisor before you became a pollster and uh, political researcher, but who would you choose? Well, and obviously I'd have to say Nicky Morgan for that, because I <laughs> uh, yes, used to be my boss. Ah, yes, you the former Cabinet Minister um, who was here last week. <laughs> uh, she was. Uh, but no, there was someone in the group, and I'm going to steal their answer, actually, which was... Um, it was David Attenborough, 30 years younger. And I just think that would be perfect. Um, I think he deserves a bit of a rest now. He might be a bit, um, a bit beyond him now. But 30 years ago, David Attenborough, I just think it would be perfect. What is it, though, now that people are coming up with those kinds of names? You know, we did hear today such lack of conviction about our leaders that we have. And then actually quite excitement and enthusiasm about other people. What is it about this generation of leaders, do you think? I think the one thing that unites all of those people we heard about, Martin Lewis, Alan Sugar, Carol Vorderman, it's authenticity. Mm -hmm. It's that sense that when they present you, when you see them, that is the real them. Yeah. And then along with that, what was interesting was people talking about that business experience mm -hmm. um, as well, particularly with uh, Lord Sugar and Martin Lewis. You know, it's that they know how to run things. They know how to get things done. And we heard a lot of criticism, and sometimes this criticism is unfair, of sort of career politicians. They want people who are going to bring something from outside mm -hmm. into politics, like both of our panellists here today mm -hmm. uh, doing different ways. They're not the usual uh, politicians. I think that's what's missing. But Anne Sugar was in Cabinet. He was an he advisor. Was trained, that's actually. right. He was an advisor to... And he became Peter Mandelson. Little, yeah, he, he was, was an advisor. In, yeah. But that sometimes then goes wrong when people come from outside you know, successive prime ministers have tried it from time to time, and sometimes it sort of blows up. Was I think it's so, oh, sorry. No, but why do you think that authenticity is not always something that people look at you as a class, as a political yeah. class, and not being personal, and think that you don't have? It, it, it was really interesting going from having nothing to do with politics to suddenly being launched into that, and how that mistrust came overnight. The, the very perception that you're in politics and all of a sudden you can't be trusted comes from this long-standing feeling that they can't be. And I think what's really important, because I know so many politicians um, across all parties, and they're really decent people, and they're all in it to make a change. Well, most of them are in it to make a change and do good. But I think once you get into politics, you become so self-aware, and I think what's lacking is that authenticity. Mm -hmm. And people need to believe that the person that they're seeing is going to deliver on the things that they've promised to deliver. And they want to be able to you know, really simply imagine, can I be their mate? Can I trust them? Do and that's, that's right, why people voted for Boris Johnson, because they saw what they could sell. The man, the zip wire, the man who I think in his own <laughs> words, you know, is, is not perfect. They saw the genuine article and that's why they voted for him. And he then, was authentic. And then we heard from our groups how many of them were then disappointed with what happened after that. But all three of you, thank you so much for thank sharing you. your insights with us this morning. <laughs> it's been great to have you. Thank you to the panel. Thank you so much to the voters in the northwest of England who gave us their time on Wednesday. It was such a pleasure to hear them all. And of course, thank you for spending your morning with us today when we've been able to hear what's really going on in some voters' minds. Maybe you agreed with a lot of what you heard. Maybe you wanted to throw something at the telly. But one thing really was clear. Right now, Britain seems to be in a bad mood and none of our politicians seem able to cheer the country up. Perhaps before they can convince you to give them your precious vote this year, maybe they first have to persuade you that they can actually make a difference. You can watch anything again on the iPlayer later or I'll chat to you on today's newscast with Paddy O'Connell. There he is. That will be on BBC Sounds later on. And of course, I will look forward to seeing you here next week, same time, same place.